Welcome to season two of the Shopstool podcast, a podcast for woodworkers and the maker community in general. With Joey Chalk from King Post Timberworks, Brian Cush from Sawdust Bureau, and Robin Lewis from Robin Lewis Makes. Hi everyone, I hope you're all very well. This is episode 34, season two of the Shop Store podcast. As always, I want to start by introducing my two co-hosts. Joey, how are you? Very good, how are you Robin? Not too bad, not too bad. And Brian, how's it going? Doing great, thanks Robin. You all right? Yeah, yeah, not too bad, not too bad up here in nice and warm Townsville. Uh, So my name is Robin Lewis, welcome to the show everyone. So tonight we're going to be talking to Andy Minerve from urban salvage where they repurpose and recycle timber products there's a big emphasis on being environmentally sustainable and keeping the ecosystem in check as part of the process and on their website there's a line and and i I really really like this that says native hardwood sales should carry an impost that deems a replacement planting of native saw log species for every log felled so i hope we kind of get into a bit of that tonight so welcome to the show, Andy. How are thank you? Thank you. I'm very well, thank you. We're, we're all very well here in Melbourne now that we're out of lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's, uh, it must have been a pretty... I, I actually know a guy quite well who just decided to leave because he was done with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. I'll yes, be back. we all thought about it. <laughs> Has it all returned fully back to normal trade and, and uh, local customers? Uh, tra- trade is, is something closer to normal now. Um, we, we weren't allowed to let the public in uh, for three months, and so it was just tradespeople in, so we are doing about half our normal trade. But now it's back to normal, so we're reminded uh, what it's like to have the public back, which is great. <laughs> it's quite, quite impressive that it's t- turned back around so quick. I mean, do, being there, do you feel like it's... Um, people are, s- are slowly moving back into it, just in no, general? No, de- definitely people were uh, uh, are more slowly moving back into it. We found in the first few days people were out having coffee and catching up with friends, lots of picnicking in parks, um, and it took a few days before the crowds sort of came in to, to our factory to, to sort of purchase timbers, but, but um, it's, it's sort of back to what, we, what we'll call normal now. Uh, the strange thing was before the Stage 4 lockdown, T- businesses like mine had never been busier. The the COVID uh, uh, sort of quarantining at home thing had meant people were, were observing what needed to be done at home, what little projects they could do to keep themselves busy. And uh, uh, we have never had so many people in. Stage three lockdown was the busiest period we've ever had. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. It's pretty much the and same that- here as well. With the same in the stage three lockdown, people realised that Oh shit! I better go buy some paint or have something ready to occupy my time and work on the house. Absolutely, yes. Uh, it's, it's been a little difficult because there hasn't been the level of demolition happening in Melbourne, and, and I imagine in, in lots of parts of the world. So sourcing recycled materials has become more competitive and more difficult. Um, meanwhile, there's a greater demand for them. So we've had a few supply issues in the last few months. That's for sure. I wanted to talk to you about that. I mean, it's a good, it's a good point, a good place to start, I suppose. Um, I've always thought what a hard job demo guys must have constantly being on the lookout and, and kind of getting the lead before anyone else about how do you, how do you get these timbers? Um, and I also, in the same question, I guess I want to ask, did you manage to get anything out of the Christchurch earthquake uh, demolitions? Uh, we haven't certainly seen anything in, in Australia from the Christchurch demolitions. No, I, m- I imagine that'll be, you know, fairly treasured locally, yeah. as most, most of these things are. Um, sourcing material from, recy- from, from demolished buildings is actually uh, more difficult than it sounds, and, and there's a, the sort of primary demolishers who do the, have the contract to demolish buildings, and then there's this whole uh, industry of what we might call strip-out crews or people whose job it is to come in under the demolishers and remove the valuable materials uh, and, and, and on-sell them. Right. Um, and, and they're generally the people we buy from. It's often not the actual demolishers themselves. Okay. Oh, so you don't have a crew that actually goes in and does the removal? Historically, we did. We, we actually used to be a demolition company um, 
uh, in the 1980s and early 90s, we did have our own crews, but the things have sort of changed and now we're a sort of glamorous indoors uh, timber yard and I just buy products from other people who do the sourcing and do the stripping out and, and do the sorting. I, I don't have... I have a 1,000 square metre warehouse. We don't really have the space there to do all that on site. Um, it, it's done elsewhere, mainly by, by contractors. What kind of um, condition is the timber in? Because looking through your images on the Instagram and stuff, it looks like almost all of it has been at least skip planned. Are you guys doing that or are you getting it? No, I, I buy all my products that I buy are more or less finished, ready for sale. Wow. I, I do have some secondhand flooring material that is the only unimproved product that we sell. Uh, it's basically denailed and cleaned a little and, and on sold. Um, but all of our uh, the structural material we get from demolished buildings and, and other, other structures is metal detected and processed and dressed. Uh, so it's, it's ready for sale as a finished product. So um, we really don't sell any sawn product as such. That's a really nice, um, a really nice thing to have the option to buy dressed timber. And I think that would really help in terms of DIY sales, I would think. Absolutely. Yeah. We're one of the only places you can walk in and find a really good range of timbers, new and recycled, that are dressed and ready to go. Yeah. A lot of, lot of other merchants sell more sawn material. Um, and as you guys would all know, that it's, it's difficult to see what you're actually buying uh, until it's kind of dressed. Yeah. So I come from a, a joinery background and a bit of carpentry, and I know that you know, most people that walk in prefer to see what they're actually buying. If you're buying five planks of timber to make a beautiful tabletop, and one of them's just not right. It's just not going to work. <laughs> just slightly off tone, then just yes. destroys it. Yeah, yeah. We've got a. I've got a um, a timber studio. Well, a woodworking studio just up the road from me, and that's something that they are putting a lot of emphasis on at the moment. Is because they sell timber as well. Is having a shop front, because as as someone who's a little bit unsure about about buying timber, if you walk into a traditional lumber <laughs> it is, yard. Yeah. It's really daunting. You, you know, I haven't been doing this my whole life. You know, the, the, the terminology is different. You can't, as you say, you can't actually see anything. You've got to either know what you're going for or know stuff. So if you can put up a shop front, like you guys have done just looking at the pictures on your website, and I can walk in and say, there's a piece of red oak. Yeah, it's funny you say shop front. One of my competitors who has like a five-acre yard up the bush somewhere famously recently referred to my 1,000-square-metre warehouse. Uh, he famously said, I don't know how Andy operates out of that milk bar. <laughs> 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 and uh, and I, I love referring to that, my, my milk, bar. milk bar. Yeah, but we very awesome. much focus on our, you know, attention to having things well presented. The place is really neat and clean. Timbers are well-dressed, well-labeled. The staff are always really helpful. Uh, Another one of my fa competitors famously said to me once, I can have all the tyre kickers and table makers. And, uh, you know, a lot of people in our industry are not that fond of dealing with the public, whereas we really love it. We really love, you know, engaging with people and talking about their projects and uh, working through it with them. Um, we're keen to see that things go well for them. It's, it is so true, like... Andy, I think I only just reminded you this year of it, but I actually first came into your workshop or into your uh, timber yard about 20 years ago. Right. <laughs> and uh, as a student, when I was studying architecture and I had to buy timber for a project, I had no idea what I was looking for. I'd been into two other timber yards, walked around and walked, walked out. <laughs> had a few evil eye yeah. looks from staff and just felt intimidated. And then when I came in, I remember it was either you... Or, um, or Graham came up to me and instantly just started talking to me, asked me what I wanted. And it's just, it's the reason why I love helping smaller businesses as well with my business. You know, you create that support oh, network and um, yeah, it's fantastic. So I would honestly say to any small makers in Melbourne, if they're looking for advice and looking for timber, Andy is honestly the man to see. Um, oh, thank you. Just put everything back in the racks and leave it clean. And you won't get <laughs> <show that. laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very good. So in terms of the, the, uh, the recycled products that you get, obviously we've talked about demoing old buildings. Is that the main source of where you would be getting it from? I mean, I know you're, you're, you're buying it from someone else, but are there any odd places that you tend to get this timber from or interesting places? Uh, if, you, if you're talking specifically about recycled material, most of our recycled material comes from less exciting demolition of houses in Melbourne. 
And and these days they're mainly 1950s and 60s houses just being demolished to make way for, uh, uh, you know, multi-residential development. Um, it's not particularly exciting. We do occasionally get interest, more interesting things like bridge timbers and wharf timbers um, where we know the location and it's a more interesting location or sometimes from sort of historical factories and warehouses around Melbourne or Brisbane or Sydney. Um, and there's nothing nicer than sort of referring to the source of the, of the materials. Um, I love it. Clients love it. It gives it more of the story. You can sort of engage with its history a little more. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I just wondered if there might have been some, <laughs> some either some iconic buildings that you've that you've essentially been able to recycle, or if there's the, the, the main the main reason I bring this up is as someone who's a, more on the, the hobbyist side of woodworking, I have a conversation with people a lot. Where do you get your hardwoods from? Because as someone who's yeah. starting out, it's really hard. And I've always got my hardwoods from either renovating my house and pulling the wood out of it and then building something with it, um, or just, just a, a, you know, I'll be driving around and I'll see a house being demoed and literally go tap on the, on the JCB and say, do you mind if I just pull that out while, you know, while you're on smoker? <laughs> but it really seems like a, people struggle with this idea of finding that. And that's why I was really interested to see where you guys get yours from is it do you need to know people or is it just wherever you find it uh we it's always a case of having to know people mm. it is surprisingly competitive now you know 20 mm. years ago it was an issue of convincing demolishers not to send things to the tip because it was cheaper to do that and okay. now it's a case of as expensive for them to send it to the tip um the the, the materials are really highly prized for for, for all sorts of reasons um, and there's almost a tender process uh, to secure timber from demolition sites and you have to know the right people and offer the right amount of beer to the right people <laughs> and, then, and then still keep your fingers crossed because whatever you think the deal is that you've done with the guys at the demolition site or the, the, the strip-out crew, someone else might just come in at the last minute and, and beat you to it. So, yes. um, yeah. Do you feel that the trend... Um, <clears throat> for recycled timbers and reclaimed timbers, it has now reached a point where with the increasing labour market and labour rate and the price of recycled timber coming up, do you think now your, can, your customers understand why recycled timber costs pretty much the same as, as new sawn timber? Yeah, I think that the customers who appreciate recycled timbers certainly do, but I still regularly get people coming in saying, why are you charging so much? You get this for free. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and I have to set them straight, of course. Yeah. I, I literally pay more for a lot of my recycled materials now than I do for new product, uh, and there's good reasons for that. Yeah. Do you, yeah. when, when you're pulling materials, so most of the houses and things that are being demoed in Victoria, they're returning things like mess-made timbers and Victorian ashes and things like yep. that. Do you ever have to kiln dry them or they just come no, out? No, absolutely. Uh, we, we have a, a, a strong association with Timber Zoo, who is our main supplier of those recycled materials. They're based down in Geelong. Um, every, everything they get goes through a redrying process, whether it needs it or not, because it's oh. best to assume that these things have been sitting in the rain for some period. Oh, right. um, so they have a, a reconditioning shed. It's not, a, it's not as sophisticated a kiln set up as big sawmills might have, but it's certainly a, a big shed with a heating, heat exchange system, um, fan system, that all the timber is brought down to a certain moisture level before anything is reprocessed. So it's all metal detected and graded and sorted uh, and then what they call putting in stick with sticks between all the layers and it's put in this big drying shed and uh, it's generally there for, for two weeks or so to make sure things are absolutely uh, bone dry in that sort of 10 to 12% moisture content zone, which is, which is where you want it in Melbourne. Yeah. And yeah. then it's processed and turned into the products because if you don't, uh, you, you'll have problems down the track. And, and we've all been through cases, like literally today, I've had to notify one of my sawmills where I buy new timber that they have to come and collect a whole whole lot of timber that they've sold to me because our testing has confirmed that it's consistently in that sort of 13 to 17% moisture zone, which wet. is just going to cause problems down the track for, for, for most people who buy it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so that kind of brings up an interesting question and probably something... I don't know, none of us thought we might talk about. But um, so 
Do you find that you end up having to explain a lot about what timber movement is to the, your kind of clientele? And do you, Absolutely. Do you find Constantly. that people... <laughs> are people just... What, I mean, because what, what I find interesting, like, so even if you told them that timber moves, and, of course, they don't believe you, um, yeah. and then do you actually have a responsibility? I mean, I wouldn't think you do, but if they go and make a tabletop and then it splits, even though you told them... It's going to shrink. Um, do they come back fuming at you for selling def- like faulty timber? Yeah. In a way, that they might. But there's a my my ex business partner Dave Hutchins, who's the, the owner and manager of Timber Zoo, uh, used to famously say, uh, "We you know give people all the advice you like, but we're not the timber police. Let them do what they want." <laughs> yeah. uh, and the, the classic thing is we have a range of pre glued up tabletops and all sorts yeah. of things and people want to buy them and use them outdoors <laughs> as outdoor tables and yeah. we explain to them of course that that's just not done and they say why not and they want to have an argument with you about it and uh, some of them have a go at it anyway and it, almost invariably it fails on some level and cracks and splits and whatever and that's yep. that's just something they don't they don't often come back to me and complain too much about it but um, it's uh, certainly those sort of issues with movement in timber and w- what's the sort of appropriate use of timber is something that we talk about all day, every day to clients because a lot of our clients are uh, people who are embarking on, you know, their first project or their second project or something that's the first of that type and you really have to give them a lot of advice on what's a good idea or or not and and all of our staff are generally people who have had good experience with timber and and know what's good advice. Hmm. Yeah. Now, going going back to the... the, Sorry, Joey, did you want to say something? No, no, you, you go, you go. Going back to the the drying process, just from pulling out the timber in the couple of houses that I've owned, the timber that I get out is like, it's dry, but it's also splintery. So yes. in my mind, it's gone past that dryness, you know, that, that workable dryness, and it's into a, a too dry. Would you, would you find the same thing, and would you have to essentially no. rehydrate the wood? No, it's, it's not so much that it's it's too dry. The splintery thing is because most of these timbers were put into service as a structure incredibly wet. Yeah. And and so the drying process happened quite dramatically once they were a roofing timber that got hot or they were somewhere that, that dried too rapidly effectively, and in that process ah. they sort of crack, crack and split a bit more than what uh, timber wood drying at a sawmill. If, if, if a sawmill is drying timber for, for sale as a, as a floorboard or as a, as a joinery timber, they manage the drying process more slowly than what timber in a structure would have would have been dried. Okay. So, so it cracks and splits and looks like it's it's all dried and horrible, but yeah. in reality it's actually not at a bad moisture content. It's, it's just had a hard life. Okay. That's interesting. It's also the, 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 the timber that I've used is also exceptionally hard yes. and we've talked about this on the show how the the wood just seems to get harder and harder so when you know i put out pulled out a what i can only imagine is like a spotted gum something like that joist definitely i mean this would have put up a fight to an axe yes now a lot, a lot of the timbers especially up in your neighborhood are are like stone as we say um <laughs> they don't like to float when they're dry <laughs> uh, so they, they are really spectacularly good timbers and they are very, very tough. The, the older they are, the, you know, generally the denser, older growth yeah. timbers are a little heftier than, than the younger stuff we get now. But, but I still get uh, new timber from and recycled timber from up in Queensland and um, the, the newer timber is, is still fairly impressive timber. All those ironbarks and spotted gum and the things you get up there are, are incredible timbers. Even if it's a 40 or 50-year-old tree, they're spectacularly good. But when you get older material, uh, it's just that little bit heavier and harder. So you reckon it's not necessarily that the timber is, in the drying process, has become more dense. It's probably just very old-growth timber. Generally, just, just older-growth timber can right. be a bit heavier and harder. Yeah, that's, that's generally the case. Yeah. Could I just get you, we've got, you know, a fair few international listeners. Could you just paint a rough map of Australia and explain the types of, <laughs> like, the types of timbers that you're buying from different areas? You know, you, you say you're getting your iron box and spotted gums from, yes, from Queensland and things, but just yep. paint a bit of an East Coast map of, of where we well, get the, things Well, the, the East Coast, start, starting from down south, I mean, in Tasmania we tend to get 
uh, a grouping of timbers that they generically refer to as Tasmanian oak, which, which is really three main species. It's, it's messmate stringy bark, alpine ash and mountain ash, which are just grouped together as a marketing product called Tasmanian oak, and that's something that I get a lot as, as second-hand floorboards. I sometimes buy it as new timber also. Um, as you get into Victoria, um, the timbers that we, we get from demolished buildings that we sort of generically refer to as messmate are a bigger mix of sort of species, messmate and other stringy bark species, ash species, other lesser-known species, because the, the sawmills all around Victoria historically, there were, there were hundreds and hundreds of sawmills. Literally every town had a sawmill or two. Um, so so the, the mix of timbers is probably somewhere between 15 and 20 common species that were cut in Victoria f f for those sort of common hardwoods. And as you get further up towards the border of New South Wales and Victoria, there, there was a lot of red gum cut along the, along the river there, the Murray River and other rivers. Uh, red gum was very popular. Uh, getting further north, we start getting into things like black button spotted gum from New South Wales and, and iron bark. And, and further north into Queensland, again, you, you get more of those sort of heavy, hard, dense, durable things like tallow wood and spotted gum and iron bark uh, that, are, that are really the, 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 the most impressive of all our timbers. Um, heading over west, in Western Australia, we tend to get um, jarrah is probably the most famous of those species from over there. Um, a little less so, a timber called Kari, K-A-R-R-I, which is, which is reasonably good timber outdoors, a sort of another reddish timber. The most spectacular thing they get over there is uh, a timber called Mari, um, M-A-R-R-I, which is a highly featured sort of thing with lots of gum vein. Very, very interesting timber. I, I sort of, not, not a huge fan of it, but it's very popular if people want lots and lots of gum veins and holes to fill. Um, <laughs> Uh, and there's another species that I'm particularly fond of from Western Australia called Wandu, W-A-N-D-O-O, -O, which is very much like grey ironbark from up in Queensland and, and one of the hardest things you, you'll ever find. There's, there's a famous measure of how hard timber is. It's called the Janka rating. Yeah. And I, I sort of resent it in a way because people always say, I want my floorboard to have the highest Janka rating possible, <laughs> uh, which, which is really unnecessary because yep. any decent hardwood is still a good floorboard. But the, there's one timber, one of the few timbers that makes 14 on the Janka rating is this timber Wandu. And yep. uh, the Janka rating is, is, is calculated by how many times this mechanical device takes to hammer a particular size ball bearing halfway into the timber. And so the higher the number, the, the higher amount of, of bashes it took to get it in. And a, a Wandu's oh, up right. there at at 14 on the Janka rating and spectacular stuff. I think bull oak is supposed to be the, from what I've read, that's the yep. hardest and that's here in Australia as well. Uh, absolutely. I think it's right up there too. It might even be a 15, but it's, it's such a rare thing that uh, you, you rarely see it referred to on these lists. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. While, you're, while you're talking about species, I have uh, a pretty good collection of HNT Gordon hand planes. Oh, yeah. And they're all made from Gigi or ringed Gigi. Um, I've seen a little bit about how h and Gordon go about finding those logs. They go kind of hunting once a year for uh, a couple of trees. Um, is that a, like it's a really nice timber and it smells really interesting uh, and it looks beautiful. Is that a timber that you've seen before or is it just such a rare beast that... It it's a very up. rare thing. There's a, there's a whole, great number of these sort of interesting arid zone and tropical mm -hmm. zone sort of rare species that you just don't see in any commercial volume. When I say that, yeah, there's right. enough to, to make tool handles and other interesting little things. Yeah. Uh, in fact, my, my father is a, is, a, is a carver and he carves a very small uh, a thing called a netsuke. It's a Japanese art form, a very, very tiny little thing, um, intricate intricately carved and he, he only uses those sort of arid zone species and finds really interesting tiny little pieces and does some uh, really fine carving on it. Anyone who's interested in, in fine wood carving should look up on the internet my father Rudy Minner R-U-D-I-M-I-N-E-U-R and look up some of his carvings because it's incredible. Awesome. Um, I, I have a very, very talented father. I don't claim to be talented in any way. I'm just a merchant. <laughs> but, uh, but, I, but I am inspired, you know, to, to love timber by, by my father and his incredible work and it's well worth looking up. That's but but cool. those, those sort of timbers that he uses and you're talking about are, are, are sort of specialty things that you only find in small volumes. Yeah. yeah. And we are asked for them constantly, by the way. <laughs> oh, you do? Well, that was actually yes. going to be my question is, do you find there's a particular species that you guys sell more of? And is it because it's more eye-catching or is it because that's what people know? 
Uh, we we are um, more often asked for high feature messmate type products these days. Lighter coloured hardwoods with black insect markings and dark gum veining and all that sort of thing. Um, that that seems to be the sort of the higher the feature, the more popular it is these days. Uh, that's the sort of thing we're asked for the most, without a doubt. Hmm. Yeah, because I guess your traditional grading is more on the clarity of the wood. The clearer that, the wood, yeah, the more expensive it is. That's pretty much it. I mean, we, we sell a lot of things mainly with a lot of character. Yeah, so, so because we're, we're known for selling recycled materials, people normally assume that we're going to have timber with a lot of natural character in it um, and some, obviously some of the evidence of its, of its past life as a structure also. So that seems to be mainly why people come in. And then I get people like Brian Cush here coming in for the, for the beautiful, perfect-looking pieces that are <laughs> a little less so uh, that suit his beautifully designed oh, work a little still, more. I still don't mind a wee bit of feature. In the, right, in the right place. <laughs> All in its place, yes. Yeah. I saw yeah, uh, on your Instagram, Andy, that you had uh, some NZ Rimu in stock. And um, is it, was it something that happened that did New Zealand send a bunch of natives over to Melbourne and, and the early settlements to, for, for buildings? It, or? It, it certainly did. In the, in the early period, probably from the mid-19th uh, century, to the start of the 20th century, there was enormous amounts of New Zealand kauri pine yep. sent all over the world, like yeah. huge wasn't, amounts. Wasn't there a thing that um, New Zealand kauri basically rebuilt San Francisco yeah. after the, after the it was It was there. amazing, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and, and when that started to uh, sort of peter out, they, they did send out some volumes of, of rimu and a, and a couple of other species, but mainly rimu after the kauri. And, that, and it was only for a period, you know, through the 1920s and 30s, I think, that we saw the, the rimu. Yeah. Um, it's funny, rimu is one of these odd species that um, gets a, a, an infestation of a borer that, that eat it, you know, and it's mainly used as a floorboard. That's right. Um, and and we, if people come in with a sample of rimu for me to help <laughs> supply, uh, from 20 paces away you can tell it's a piece of rimu because it looks like a piece of honeycomb. It's yeah, so it's eaten out by borer. I don't know if that's the case in New Zealand, whether you have that, that problem with the Amobium borer. Uh, I'm not sure on the technical name. There's a couple of species. It certainly does like to get into the sapia stuff. The heartwood's generally yeah. not too bad. Um, there's another beetle called a two-tooth beetle that is native here, and it really just loves cowrie and rimu, and it will, t it will put, like, pencil-sized holes all through your timber, and that's, that's not a good one. <laughs> I'm, I'm really fond of some of these old timbers just myself and I still pull things out of skips just just for my own personal stash yeah. and, and scour eBay and Gumtree and I did recently find some really magnificent planks of kauri um, that were big wide sort of 14 or 15 inch wide planks um, from an 1870s uh, cheese factory down at Warwick Nabil which is sort of cool. in west of Geelong. Um, someone had them up on, on, on Gumtree and uh, spectacular planks, only about six foot long and, you know, yeah. f they were 350 or 370 wide, uh, but a real find, like, and, I, and I'll just keep those. I don't know what for, but no, yeah. I'll never, never, ever sell them because you very rarely see them anymore. So I wanted to ask you, because I, I was thinking about what, I'm, what we're going to talk about, and, and there is, it's incredibly difficult to get what I guess I would class as old, old new stock, so timber that's been stashed away for a hundred years um, because it's, it's still available. We can still get cowrie and rimu even though the milling of it is essentially, I'll say illegal for want of a better phrase. Um, but I, I talk to people who know people who have a cousin who's seen these giant warehouses full in someone's farm and, and you're talking like something like a workshop You've got like a thousand square meters. I know there's one in a particular town, about a thousand square meters, seven meters tall, just stocked with cowrie, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And do you know of like reserves and stockpiles <laughs> like that? <laughs> not know, not from a personal <laughs> level, but have you heard of things like that where people I, are just? I absolutely have. They sound like the stuff of legends, but they're true. Yeah. La last year, somebody <laughs> came to me and said their grandfather had stashed a whole lot of the 300 by 50 Huon pine. Yeah. And, and oh. Huon pine is the Kauri equivalent, even more exotic, from Tasmania. Yeah. Yeah. And that it was in a shed somewhere in, in Victoria. 
and it was like an, an enormous quantity. It was like 20 cubic metres of it or something. Yeah. It w- would have been more than $100,000 of timber. Yeah. And I asked them, where is it? And they wouldn't tell me. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't exactly. even say that the, the region it was in. Yeah. You know, and it was something so <laughs> precious. And uh, uh, they were just wanting to know what it was kind of worth. <laughs> yeah. And it really, you know, they could sit on it. The longer they sit on it, the more it's going to be worth. So uh, but, uh, people sit find, on these things. What's, what's interesting is that people do sit on them. And there's, uh, I think, one of two things happen. They sit on them so long, expecting to maybe build a house from it or something. They, but what happens is they go in and find that the beetles and the borer have found it, no, no matter, because <laughs> they haven't been checking yeah. on it. And I've had that where a man has bought in his personal stash and I started dressing it and the whole lot was just went into the skip. I think he ended up burning it all. Um, so that happens where it just gets left too long or then it just constantly gets left and sat on because, oh, we're going to keep it for something special and that thing never happens and you just end it, up it with often a never pile happens. of wood and <laughs> nothing <laughs> happens yep. with it. And it's so disheartening, I think, sometimes when... And, like, I, I'm, I'm all for saving stuff and using it where it should be used, but at some point it's got to be used, otherwise what are we doing? No, it's, it's, it's true, like, and, and in the recycled... Um, game in Melbourne at the moment and other parts of Australia, there are people hoarding recycled timber in enormous volumes. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know of a couple of people in Victoria who, who are stashing tens of thousands of metres of things just to be sitting on the biggest volume of it for whatever <laughs> reason, to control the yeah. market at some point, whatever, because demand is growing, supply is dwindling, um, and I wish they'd sell me some of it. But, but so, certainly there's, there's great volumes of it around. I guess it might lead into a, a kind of swing on the conversation is that if, if um, supply of, or if, the, let's see, um, if the recycled timber is becoming more popular, is that because there's less supply of freshly sawn natives? Or is um, it just a more of an ecological I- ideal about using recycled? I, th- I think it's it's several things. There's certainly a, a shift towards an ecological ideal, uh, you know, to, to use recycled materials wherever possible. Um, that's one thing. There's also a, a huge desire for the sort of characteristics you see in recycled timbers. Um, there's still reasonably good supply of new material. Um, there, there are quite a number of sawmills left in Victoria. There might be five or six reasonable sawmills still getting some, some quite good sort of messmate and ash hardwood. Um, and, and as long as it's got a bit of natural character in it, I can sell it just as well as I can sell recycled material. Um, right. In fact, I, I, keep, I keep a few of these things to sort of subsidise the, the, uh, the, the, the supply of recycled material sometimes because I can order in... When I order recycled material, it just comes as a bit of a mixed bag, but I can certainly still order in new material graded a certain way so the batch has, is entirely full of gum vein and, right. uh, and, and, and that's kind of convenient in some ways. Yeah. Um, but but the, the desire for recycled material, you know, is is uh, uh, most mostly driven, I think, by a desire, to, you know, a genuine desire to do the right thing and 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 reuse what we can reuse. Um, and and I certainly you know value that. When I started working at this company, um, I was a little bit a shock to find that they sold new timber too. Right. Um, but the the more I looked into the industry, and this was you know 20 years ago or so the more I realised that the, the, the industry had, the, the, the native logging industry had been carved back to a, a fraction of its former self. It's something now even less than 20% of the size as it was 30 years ago. So it's, it's quite a small industry in Australia, especially in Victoria. Uh, and what little is left of this industry, I, I strongly support. You know, it's, it's one of these things. I'm, I'm always keen to see sustainability um, improve in the industry for some strange reason in Victoria, they still prefer to do clear felling of coops like they do in Tasmania. Um, I think that's as, as much an economic thing as a, as a sort of a... a, a I, I really still don't understand why they, they stick with that practice. It's just the ugliest, most destructive thing they could do. The forest does grow back, but, but it is, it's a horrific thing to do. So as opposed to what, like clear felling? So I think um, Robin was <coughs> so, just asking, uh, what's, what, are, what is the difference between like what is clear felling versus what, 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 what option? As, as, as you head further north up the coast, the, the, the practices are more of selective felling um, and less of clear felling. 
Um, so they tend to take out the timbers that are going to be popular saw logs, valuable saw logs, and leave the rest of it. In, in Victoria and Tasmania, there's still a great demand for the the uh, the rougher logs and the the, 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 the the trees that are not great shape logs, that those just go for wood chip. Um, so virtually the whole lot is cut and sent off to, you know, most of the timber that's cut in Victoria and Tasmania is actually sent to wood chip. Right. Um, that, that's the terrible thing about it. And I, I still don't quite understand why that has to happen. So do they just come in and just clear an entire area out? They do. It is, the it is replanted right. and managed to be, to be regenerated, mm. but it, it is still uh, something that is in the process of changing. Um, in Victoria and Tasmania, there's, a, there's a, a push to try and have the government forestry practices certified under the FSC certification scheme, which you would have seen for you know, all sorts of European and American species and, and for a lot of pine products and paper products. Um, and that's a really great thing moving forward, that there's a, a, a sort of more sustainable management of that sort of thing. Yeah. So you're obviously very interested in trees then in general. Does that... Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's fair, I, think, I think it's fair to say. Does, yeah. does that go outside of timber as a woodworking project? Like, do you have a big yard where you are involved? You know, are you, do you find yourself interested in gardening as general and, and that I, kind of thing? I, I generally, I'm not that interested in gardening, but every opportunity I have to get out into the bush and into the mm. Australian wilderness, I absolutely love it. I camp at the drop of the hat. Uh, I'll go camping for one night wherever I can after work on a Saturday. Huh. Um, I love nothing more than going out into the Australian countryside. And, and I, I like the drier, more arid country than the sort of high country and the big tall forests. I love those trees too, but there's just something about heading west and heading north from Melbourne and, and getting into that sort of desert country that I, I find a lot more interesting. Um, Nothing yeah, that, and the trees are smaller there, but, but in some ways the landscape's more interesting. You, you can see further. You can, you can find things on the ground, but I love nothing more than being out of the city. Joey and Brian, how do you guys feel about it? The reason I ask is um, I've, I was never so much into just, you know, the natural beauty until I started woodworking and then I started getting into timber species and now I'm looking at trees going, oh, that's a, that's a Morton Bay ash and I know that because I've worked with it and that's what the tree looks like and ah, oh, there's yeah. the connection. Suddenly you get involved and it's a lot more interesting. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a little more difficult with eucalypt species because in some ways a lot of them look the same. <laughs> <laughs> so so you can go to... My, uh, my ability to choose different eucalypts in a forest is very, very poor. It's, it's, it's quite difficult. I mean, in some of the areas, you know, east of Melbourne, you, you can tell which ones are the messmate and which ones are the mountain ash, and then there's all these other things and you, you just have no idea. Yeah. Mm. But yeah. to answer your question, I, I was, I was a, more of a uh, closet bird, bird geek growing up, so <laughs> my uh, affiliation through watching birds in trees, yeah, that was mm. my kind of interest in nature. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. In my yard, I've got a quite a. I'm in suburbia. I've got a pretty small plot. It's a 700 square block. I have a Morden Bay ash in one corner, a paper bark in the middle, and I've just put in a. Um, it's a, a native peanuts tree. It's a quadrophilia something or other. I can't remember the name. Right. And and but I just love the idea of having a, a yard with trees. I yeah. just think it's you know what tends to happen is. With, with new developments, they come in and they just flatten the area, yep. throw up a couple palms so that they've got instant height, mm -hmm. and it looks awful. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so yes. once in, in 10 years, someone's going to have to manage all the roots around this area, but I reckon yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> it's going to look beautiful. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I definitely, um, now that we've bought a property and I can do something with it, um, I've started planting it out and I've got plans for. I mean, I really want to have, I'd love a property with developed trees on it. I really like the aesthetic of a nice developed tree, but of course we pretty much bought a section of a, like a cow farm. So essentially we just got flat sloping ground. Um, so I've gone, we've planted oak and maples and we've planted um, not so many natives right where we are because they're not going to grow in the, the wind conditions we have. But we're certainly building up. Uh, uh, we'll probably put some macrocarpas in because they they like to grow in where we are. But um, we certainly have the uh, ambition to be surrounded by 
nice big if, trees. If you ever want to see how impressive that can get to buy a bit of vacant farmland and turn it into forest and forestry, there's a, there's a very interesting guy in um, Victoria down uh, in the Otways called uh, Rowan Reed. He's worth looking up. He has a, a company called Bambra Agroforestry and he and his uh, partner move, moved there, it might be nearly 40 years ago, um, and it was literally paddocks, and they started yeah. planting with a view to re- regenerating for, for a sort of uh, e- a sort of ecosystem of sorts, but also for the purpose of harvesting the trees in the future for timber. That's and awesome. he's very outspoken um, and very very clever gentleman, and well worth looking up because if you want to know a little boy, and he does these wonderful tours down on his property once or twice a year, and they're, they're very much worth doing. Yeah, that's that's the that's the retirement dream for me. Find an yeah. old block. Well, he re- had a vision re-populate. quite young, and, and it's really uh, it's quite impressive. Yeah. So um, I, we don't have too much longer, but I'd be interested to hear how your the, the business. I mean, I'm not sure where you came into it, Andy, but how it started. How do you, how do you start, or how do you get into a recycling business like this? Well, I, I sort of this business. Uh, as it currently is, was sort of formed about 23 years ago. I started working there about 19 years ago, Mm. but I'm 51 now. When I was 15 years old, there was a demolition yard around the corner from where I lived in Surrey Hills in Melbourne, Uh, and people who know the area would think, where could there possibly be a demolition yard Uh in Surrey Hills? Because it's quite an affluent neighbourhood. But there was quite a large demolition yard along Canterbury Road there, and uh, my father was always into uh, recycling and renovating our house with material, building materials from the demolition yard in the 1970s. And so I used to, to carry along with him down to uh, the demolition yard because uh, my parents were very civilised Dutch people and the people at the demolition yard were as Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Uh, <laughs> and I'd, I'd never seen anything that looked like so much fun in my life. The characters in the demolition yard were, were fantastic. And uh, so I always used to love going down there with my father. And uh, when I was 15, I got a job there in the school holidays, denailing timber and just working Uh in the demolition yard. Uh, One thing led to another and I left school at 17 and started, there was a a guy had set up a little joinery workshop there making um, uh, recycled timber kitchens mainly. And it was mainly out of Baltic pine and recycled Oregon or Douglas fir. And so when I was 17, I started making uh, cabinetry and, and kitchens out of those sort of timbers, and they were dreadfully rough, but, you know, it was the, it was the 80s, and that, that sort of thing was very, very popular, that sort of cottage-style furniture, country-style kitchens, all that sort of thing. And yeah. so that's, that's how I sort of cut my teeth working with timber. Um, and it's hilarious because now it's all about hardwood. You know, everyone wants the, the mess made and the, and the hardwoods. Back in the, the 70s and 80s, if you tried to sell someone an old bit of hardwood, they'd just laugh at you and say, well, where's, where's, your, where's your Oregon? I don't want to know about your hardwood. <laughs> you, you couldn't mm. give hardwood away back then and, and how it's all sort of swung around. But that, that particular purely, demolition... Sorry, Andy, purely because it was difficult to work or what was the logic? I, I suppose there was cheap new hardwood available if you needed it. Um, it was difficult to work. It was so way, weird. way harder to get the nails out of uh, hardwood than it is out of out of a softwood, yeah. of course. And and you forget that when we denail timber, half of the nails just break off because they're rusted. So then you have to chisel them out carefully. And uh, you know, there's all these different tools you use to chisel them out. And then you have to metal detect the timber to check it. It's a whole lot easier with Oregon. Um, but, but but yeah, it was hilarious. You you couldn't do anything with hardwood. You, you couldn't sell it. Um, but but basically, this this demolition yard. I've sort of been off and lived in Queensland and lived in other places and done trade work and uh, you know done leather work and all sorts of other things with my hands. And uh, then this this demolition yard sort of evolved into a sort of more a boutique sort of uh, seller of recycled materials. They had doors and windows and and uh, flooring mainly. Uh, and then at some point they started selling a little bit of dress timber and, and then, you know, nearly 20 years ago I came and started working there. And I, I didn't see myself as sort of being the manager of a timber yard. It just happened. But the, the manager left and quit soon after I started and I was kind of left holding the baby and I loved it. And uh, I've never looked awesome. back. Now, now I own the business. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. It's funny you were talking about, listening to you talk about that hardwood, softwood thing. This... I was talking to someone up at this timber shop around the corner that I was talking about, about silky oak yeah. and how silky oak now is considered your you, you upper level from your, from, you know, what, what your, your um, amateur woodworker would be. Absolutely. And 
it wasn't too long ago when silky oak was seen as pine is seen today. <laughs> 10, 20 years ago, everything was yeah. built out of silky oak. Because the conversation I was having is everything in, in Queensland, all the Queenslanders, all the shutters, every, the, the window frame, everything. it's all silky oak. Yeah. You know, how did they afford that? But it's because <laughs> yeah. back then, silky oak was it cheap. Was it was throwaway. It was just the, the common thing. My father was a carpenter. Mm. I, I was born in Launceston in Tasmania, and my father was a carpenter there in the 1960s. And he says to me, they used to make draw sides out of hue and pine. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not even front, yeah, just the they sides. They used tassie tazi oak for the front and, or, or myrtle or something. But <laughs> hue and pine was nicest to make the draw sides out of. But yes. isn't, just, just as a, from a technical point, isn't it uh, actually work really well as draw sides because of uh, its stability? <laughs> it wasn't expensive then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. It's a funny world, isn't it? It is. Supply and demand. <laughs> yeah. So then in terms of the business, you are, you say obviously things are starting to pick up and, and go well. Do you see this as being an industry that is growing? plateauing or do you think it's uh, I mean obviously I hope it's not but do you think we've sort of reached a peak and it might be on its way down now? I, I think when you say the industry, my end of the industry which is valuing things greatly and selling them for a sort of higher end use has definitely been growing for the last 10 or 15 years um, at, at, at 15 years ago we were pretty much the only place in Melbourne where you could walk in and find a good range of dress material. Now there's probably another 10 businesses not unlike ours um, not necessarily as welcoming and well set up, but uh, it's certainly grown that end of it. And I think it's probably going to continue to grow in a way for the next five or ten years. Supply has become an issue of all the things I sell have become more difficult to get uh, and more expensive, of course. Uh, and in a way, that's just made it more fun for me. I, I love sourcing timber. I love shopping for timber. I love visiting sawmills, visiting demolition sites. Um, I, I think that's possibly why, why I've been successful at it, because I don't just love selling and love timber. I love sourcing and buying it um, and, and thinking what we're going to do with it. Um, so, so, look, I, I think it's a bright future for our industry, uh, as long as you're, you're clever enough to know where to keep looking for the timber. Yeah. And yeah, you certainly tick those boxes. I, uh, do you remember the um, the dresser that I made for my son, guys, that I posted yeah. on my Instagram? Mm. So that is uh, white mahogany timber, which I had never seen outside a timber yard apart from Andy's. Mm. And mm. Um, Andy said it's mainly a construction timber. Yeah, mm. up, up north it's one of these lesser species that's not sort of prized as a furniture or joinery t species. Um, and I buy right. it from sawmills that cut it for uh, structural use, and, and we bring it down and we redry it and redress it and sell it for, for furniture use. And it's an absolutely stunning it species. Incredible. It's incredible. Mm. I must say, from a Kiwi's point of view, looking in at the Aussie hardwood or just the Aussie timber selection in general, there doesn't seem to be like, uh, like over here, construction and general use is just all done out of New Zealand grown radiator pine. And, and anything else that's going to be like not painted will probably start thinking about some nicer looking natives possibly. But when I look in in Australia, it doesn't seem like there's one standard like construction style like quote unquote poor man's timber to use. It's just like there's like a gazillion no. oh, there, different there. species. And it there, seems there is like still a nightmare. largely no. There is there is still largely uh, pine species introduced pine species plantation grown here for for the main structural uses. Yeah. Uh, down south we have the radiata pine also, and up north they have a species they call slash pine, which they grow up in in, in Queensland for framing purposes. But we do we are very fortunate. We do have a, a fabulous range of of, of local hardwoods. Uh, and and some amazing softwoods too that 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 are, are, are prized like that these days they really weren't that well prized 10 20 years ago it's 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 good to see them valued like they are now hmm. slash pine that's such a queen's it's, name it's they could give it something thing. something nice and calming it's got to be aggressive because it's from Queensland. yeah and the, the irony with slash pine and those species is they're very slow growing up in queensland if you were to plant a spotted gum or a queensland blue gum next to a slash pine it would grow bigger and quicker than a slash pine You're and, and me. this is this is this is one of the, th the the odd things is you know and and this is part of the the current debate about forestry in victoria they talk about plantation 
um, that, that a lot of our hardwoods do grow quite well uh, as sort of planted species and grow quite quickly, but they all grow better when they're in a mixed species forest. So if you try and oh, grow no. one of these things as a, as a single species sort of monoculture, you, you have all sorts of issues. Um, of you know, in, in Victoria, a, a year or so ago, that the government announced that they were closing the timber industry, the native timber industry, and replacing it with plantations. It's, it's somewhat of a fantasy that you can replace uh, a native timber industry with the sort of biodiversity that comes with it and, and the quality of the timbers you get from that. You can't really replace it with plantation because the quality of the timber is very poor from plantations. It still takes 30 to 40 years to grow a decent tree and so you can't set up a plantation industry in 10 years, which is what they're claiming they're going to do. <laughs> um, you, you're certainly way better off managing native forests better you have a better outcome in terms of biodiversity and you have a better outcome in terms of the quality of the timber that you can get out of it. Uh. So plantation works for pine species, but it doesn't work so well for, for hardwoods. Yeah, makes sense. Wouldn't that be amazing to see a house being built out of a hardwood? Yeah. <laughs> wouldn't that be incredible? Yeah. You wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to clad it. You just uh, put just, put some polycarbonate well, around it and call it a house. <laughs> yeah, we certainly. I I work um, with a company from Kempsey in New South Wales called Australian Architectural Hardwoods, and and they uh, get timber mainly salvaged from uh, big warehouses and bridges and wharves and that sort of thing, and carve them up and build these incredible incredible houses out of these impressive timbers and that's another company well worth looking up australian architectural hardwood says have some incredible images on their website of the sort of things that they build uh, and some of the equipment they've had to custom make to sort of process these enormous timbers is is very impressive i've recently bought some um uh some 110 millimeter square um iron bark posts from from these people uh that were were um from uh power poles just from sydney suburban oh, streets i saw that on instagram uh, and and they're just incredible like that they, they square up these round poles That's um cool. you know and I, and I buy these these posts and the little flitches they get off the side they then cut you know floorboards out of and they, and they use everything they possibly can but their, their machinery is incredible and they employ about 30 people up there in Kempsey reprocessing all this timber they only reprocess recycled material but mainly big impressive things but uh yeah well worth looking up is it, like, what level is the technology at in terms of reducing the waste from a cut log? Like, it, oh. in, ter, in, in the in the, the the new industry, yeah, the new yeah. timber so industry, like a big, a big it's, it's quite it, it's quite impressive. Um, the the thing is that the industry has been set up now to process smaller logs because all the equipment traditionally is there to process fairly large logs, say, you know, 400 millimetre to 600 millimetre diameter logs, whereas the younger timber they're getting now is anywhere, sometimes even as small as 150 millimetre diameter. It's wow. tiny. Wow. Uh, um, and, and, you know, bigger than that also. But, but some of the stuff they're getting is very, very small. Um, so the equipment has to completely be redesigned to process smaller, smaller logs. That's yeah. the, and of course, the timber in those tiny young trees is not in any way impressive. I mean, somebody no. showed me some photographs recently of a of a, a laminated bench top from from this sort of timber, and and it was a hardwood, and there was there was about ten millimeters between the growth rings in it and, oh. and the hardwood. That the resulting timber was <laughs> n very very uh, soft to It'd say the least. I mean, yeah, surely, <laughs> surely, yeah. And, anything and, uh, around 150 mil or even going up to 200 mil, the amount of sapwood that is around the outside of that. I mean, you've probably only got 50 mil of heartwood, and then the pith, as you say. Yeah, they're yeah. very, very small. Having said that, much to their credit, they still cut these things up and join them up into panels and finger join the pieces and, and make some impressive products out of it. And, and that's, that's worth looking up to the uh, sawmill called Australian Sustainable Hardwoods at, at Hayfield in Victoria, who, who do reprocess a lot of these younger logs now and, and make some fantastic products out of it, even if the timber is quite young. It's the way of the future. Yeah, that's interesting that they're actually felling small logs, or do you think that they're, they're just kind of byproducts of larger felling industry where smaller that, species or smaller pieces are getting knocked They're partly a out. byproduct of, of clearing sort of mix, mixed age forest and trying yeah. to value add more so than the wood chip it, they yeah. would normally be sent to. Yeah, um, okay. Some of it is plantation material that's very young. Uh, the sad thing about plantation is in the last 20 years or so, there, there was a lot of plantation hardwood put in with some sort of taxation benefits offered by the government. Um, people thought they were going to get a good return on, on the timber within sort of 15 or 20 years. And uh, at some point they realised that the timber was 
only good for wood chip. It wasn't going to be very good timber unless it was 30 to 40 year old trees. And a lot of these plantations have just been abandoned. So right. um, up up in the Streslekis, you know, it's north of Melbourne. There's, there's quite a few of these sort of uh, shining gum plantations, um, and th- there's other places around where where there's sort of 15, 20 year old trees that that are just being cut. And, and the timber's okay. But it would have been a whole lot better if it had been managed for another 20 years. We would have had really impressive um, uh, timber. The, the mm. irony is in Tasmania that there was a famous campaign in the last sort of 15 years or so um, where a, a chip mill or a pulp mill was wanting to be built near Launceston uh, by a company called Guns, which, which was the biggest timber uh, company in Tasmania. And they, uh, over a period of time, replaced a whole lot of native mixed species forest in Tasmania. They cleared it and planted, a, uh, I think it might have been shining gum and it might have been uh, southern blue gum uh, in plantations uh, to feed their pulp mill that they were setting up. And that, that was going to be, you know, 10 or 15-year-old trees sent to this pulp mill, um, which never really made sense to me that you would clear native forest to do that. But that's what they did. Then guns lost the campaign to get this pulp mill built. Um, But there are vast areas of these timbers now that have been let to grow for 30 years or so. And now they're actually really impressive timbers. And Tasmania will be processing a lot of this uh, very impressive plantation timber that that wasn't meant to uh, mature as much as it did. But but now it will. uh, And it'll be great timber coming through in the next few years. That's good. Well, we've talked enough about other companies in the last <laughs> five or so minutes. I think we're going to call this to an end. But before we do, uh, Urban Selvage, where can people find you, Andy? Uh, we're located in Spotswood in Melbourne, um, uh, 190A Hall Street, Spotswood. You can just look us up, Urban Salvage. We have a website. We're on Instagram, urban underscore salvage. Uh, we're open weekdays 7.30 to 4 and Saturdays 9 till 2. There's no need to make a booking. We're open to the public again, so anyone in Melbourne's welcome to just come in. Uh, and we regularly get interstate visitors coming in too. We're conveniently located near Science Works in Spotswood and we're straight in front of the Spotswood train station. So often people get off the train on their way to Science Works and, and wander in just for a look around, which is really great. Well, if I'm, well, the next time I'm down in Melbourne, which, hey, these days might be never, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. It won't be maybe. long. Yeah, it's yeah. coming. Um, I'll certainly pop in and say hi and see what's, what's on offer. <laughs> you, you do that. You all do that. Yeah, yeah. we'll do it. So to everyone listening, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please go ahead and give it a rating on iTunes. That really does help us out. The Shop Store podcast is available on iTunes and most other podcast apps. My name is Robin Lewis. Joey and Brian, thanks again for hanging out. Andy, very, very cool stories. Um, and Thank as, you. As, as someone who's very deep and deeply entrenched in, in landscaping and gardening, it's very nice to talk to a tree nut um, <laughs> for a change, not just Thank people cutting it down and, and using it. Yeah. Uh, lovely so th- to meet you all. Yeah, and th- thanks again for coming on the show. It's always great to hear stories from people. And I, don't, I don't think we've had someone who's been so involved in timber yeah. in this way, I don't think. Oh, oh no. well, you should, you should do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all everyone, right. so thanks again, and we'll see you in the next show. See ya. Thank Catch you. See you later, guys. Bye-bye. I'll see, you, see you in a few weeks back in Melbourne, Andy. I'll be back. Oh, good on you, Brian. Thank <laughs> you. Cheers. Bye.